Hey guys, and welcome to episode 322 of The Startup Diary. I am Harrison Mudge, and I am with my next stretching co-host, Adam Callow. Hey guys, thanks for joining us on this episode. If you're new here, this is where we jump on the mics once a week and share what it's truly like to build a small business. We've gone from bootstrapping it to a bit of seed funding all the way to raising some venture capital and make every mistake every day. We're on the mics to share them with you. <laughs> every mistake, every, every day. <laughs> Maybe we're a little bit better than that, but we're here to share the mistakes that we're making with you so you don't make them too. Harry, I had a fun fact for uh, for the number 322, but it's just not jiving how, with me. How fun it's is It's not fun at fun all. Fact. Carry on. I'm not even, I'm not even going to go through it. We might tease that until the end. Today, Adam, uh, I want to go back over um, your life coach, performance coach, whatever it's, you want to okay. call it. <laughs> I was going to throw um, something at you then if you call it a life coach again. Because I know that there's been, or there is many lessons being learned from this chap. Mm-hmm. And I feel like this is just a great opportunity to dive into those topics, subjects and things like that, that you've been learning from. Did we, did we have a name for this guy? Gavin. Gavin. So Gavin. Gavin's a bit of a whiz. Um dropping knowledge left, right, and center. And I feel like we would be um, missing a huge opportunity if we didn't, maybe maybe not every week, but mm-hmm. if we don't jump on this every other week, at least just to get some, um, just some conversation. Because I think he's talking about things that us speaking off the mics, I feel like I've taken something away already, which is one of the bullet points you've made a note of. And I think it's it's probably beneficial for everyone that's listening because maybe they can take something away from it as well. So... I did ask you to make some notes and you made literally three bullet point notes, <laughs> which I commend you for. It's more than I most people work. get. <laughs> I did the work. <laughs> so, um, yeah, do you want to do you want to just go through these bullet by bullet and explain what they are? Yeah, I guess, I guess for if you act as the, the list, because you've got a little bit of context to some of this mm. stuff now, because we've been talking off the mics about it. If I say something that you think that you know, but the listeners will mm-hmm. be like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. Can you zoom in? You act yeah. as the listener just to, to challenge me and get me to explain a little bit more detail. Yeah. And if, if anyone hasn't listened to episode 321, which was the previous week's show, mm-hmm. go back and listen to that because that is the first time we speak about Adam's life. Performance coach. Sorry. <laughs> performance coach. Um, you wearing that coffee. <laughs> <laughs> come and get it so, <laughs> um, so the first literally there are three bullet points aren't they I'm like oh what did I mean when I'm I impressed that? at the level of detail in the notes to so the, the first bullet just says bell jar mm-hmm. so through the session he can and I don't, I don't want to give the context how the sessions work because it's just it will just take too long go back and listen to the last show if you haven't it will just give you an idea for what the performance coach is about and why I'm going through that exercise right now um, but there's a bell jar so Way back when, people used to have something called a bell jar. Are you smiling at already? <laughs> I'm laughing at the bell jar. Um. <laughs> so in the back garden of people's homes... Um, you say I, this with such conviction like you've been there and seen the jars as well. That's what I, kind that's of, what I like. I, I thought, I've done a quick Google. Okay, that's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> that's good enough. So from my understanding, uh, and it doesn't really make a difference, but uh, back in Victorian times, and that might be the wrong period, but people had bell jars which is in the back garden when you had plants to protect the plants from the surroundings the weather the bugs the insects you'd put this glass jar over the plant and that's that's called a bell jar and the reason that this came up in the coaching session was he obviously picked up that i can be fairly emotional and reactive Mm -hmm. to things and one of the key lessons that we really dug into was there's certain people within your team that will be thick skinned and as you get emotional highs and lows they can be like this is just the way it is here it always works out crack on let's get on with work Mm -hmm. and like it always it always plays out we always win but as you grow uh, there'll be people within the team that aren't that thick skinned so how the ceo acts within a business is how other people will naturally react within business so it's this whole behavior breeds behavior mentality is if someone sees a ceo going ecstatic when a new deal comes in but going mental when they lose a contract lose a deal or something goes wrong your whole company could be on this emotional roller coaster and that's not how you lead people to get the best out of them 
So the, the reason this bell jar comes in is... Um, you, and I'm pretty sure we covered this on the last... I think this came up in the last episode. Oh, okay. Yeah, Apologies so. if I'm covering that again, but so I'll whistle through it. But I think you've used the bell jar. Oh, I've used the bell jar, yeah. I think that's why it's worth talking about. Okay. Again. So quick recap is there's, there's something called a stimulus, which is, means something happens in your surroundings. Then you've got your response. The idea of the bell jar is... Uh, information is not good it's not bad it's just information and when something comes into you 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 basically put this bell jar over the top of it Mm -hmm. where you don't react to it you can just analyze it and one of my activities off the back of the first session was put down two times three times when you've used the bell jar or on reflection when you haven't used the bell jar and document what you went through in terms of what the stimulus was did you bell jar it? What the response was? So I went through that and there was two situations that came up uh, and I won't bore everyone with all those because they're quite personal to me, not in a personal mm-hmm. way, it's just boring for the listeners. But one of them was with the wife, um, which is we, we lo- we've we just launched a podcast. Actually, I will go into this one because she doesn't listen to the show, so she can't tell me off. Um, <laughs> uh, so one of them was with the wife in the car and we just launched the Dad Knows Best podcast. Mm-hmm. And I got something wrong in the first episode about her uh pill and bits like that anyway uh, not for this as show you, as everyone's you, just as being you see, really uh, <laughs> has learned from <laughs> but she as soon as i got that wrong she went off the wall at me for not knowing that how could i get that wrong and we ended up getting into a fairly large <laughs> argument because of it on the way down to legoland and i guess what's actually going to happen on this podcast just speaking slightly aside is because I'm going through something at the moment through the performance coach and it's all around business, but the thing that I've taken away from it is he's not just zooming into business. He wants to make sure that the building blocks of my tool set mm. are in place. It does naturally affect your life as well. So there might be some lifestyle stuff in here as well. <laughs> not that it's a life coach, um, but just be prepared for that on the mics because I think the, the initial learning that I've gone through is you can't just go and get coached about business if there's other areas or other tools that you need to learn. And the tools that you learn to manage your team will naturally help you if you're a, a father or a husband or whatever mm-hmm. that is. So th- that situation happened, but then off the back of it, I didn't put the bell jar on. And on reflection, you kind of, you're asked to say, well, actually, what what was she going through at that point in time? Put yourself mm-hmm. in the other person's shoes rather than just reacting to it. And the thing that I wrote down was, she's reacted that way. I thought she was being unsupportive because it's subconsciously time away. Every Tuesday night we record a podcast. She resents it a little bit. So why is she not being supportive? She, this is her way of digging at me for not being there on a Tuesday night. This show is something that's taken me away for two, three hours a day, once a week. Mm-hmm. Well, that couldn't be further from the truth. And I know that on reflection, However, I still reacted the way that I did, saying you're unsupportive. And obviously when you say to your wife you're unsupportive, shit hits the fan. Whereas on reflection, I said, in my notepad, not to her, <laughs> this would have been, <laughs> it would have been better to her. She probably feels worried that if I got that wrong, which is something that is blatantly obvious that I should have known, what else did I get wrong because it's getting published to the world? So that for me was an example of where the bell jar would have helped me out because it would have actually helped me better communicate with my wife. And the reason this is on this show is the whole thing that I went in, I had three reasons I wanted to go to performance coach and one of them is better communication. So this is where this, this obviously this tool out of his toolbox is how I think about it. Um, I've realized that when I go there, he's got like this tool box next to his, not a real one. Uh, and as I'm talking, he goes, okay, you need to learn this technique and this tactic and I'll teach you that tool so you've got it. So then actually off the, off the side of it, and this is probably one for DKB, but not this, but me and the wife started talking about the coaching mm-hmm. and it's significantly impacting already. And she raised it, not me, how we're communicating with each other. Because her response after we then three days later spoke about this was on reflection, I don't know why I reacted the way that I did because you wouldn't have said it if you didn't believe it. Like you wouldn't have just made that up to try and piss me off. (laughs) (laughs) You clearly disagree, Uh, but- Oh no, I don't don't disagree. Which was- Everything I say, I 100% believe. It's just not always It's fact. (laughs) It just doesn't sometimes mean that it is actually correct. So, and then the other one was internally in the team, we had a a project on and shit hit the fan in the 11th hour. Um, And what I would have normally done 
was reacted in an emotional way because it's it was a large partnership for us. Mm-hmm. It was our first event with that partner. And normally you would have seen me react a lot differently to how I reacted. Out of curiosity, when, when, when you saw all this going on, it was possibly one of my most stressful days in the last 12 months. When you saw how I reacted to it, what were, what were your thoughts? Well, we'd... Because what, what, that was on a... Ch- yeah. Was that on a Tuesday? Yeah. So it was conveniently after we'd first mentioned the bell jar. Yeah. Like so within like, within like whole, two hours. Yeah, the whole thing was super fast. Like, it couldn't have happened at a better time to 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 see it, to see um, the bell jar in being applied to the situation. Um, yeah, it was... I mean, it was... You could feel the tension and the stress, mm-hmm. but it was... It was um, yeah, I could. I because I because I had inside baseball on on what was happening internally from your side of things. I could see the the deep breath. The how do we fix this problem as opposed to how do I make people suffer? Yeah, <laughs> which is like, which is the right thing to do, really. Like one hundred percent. Like with it, it, with any situation, it would be. <clears throat> you've dropped the ball. We need to sort this out. You've really pissed me off. That doesn't help mm. at all. Yeah. And the bell jar really helped to say actually, in a, and I was on a time limit because I had to I had to add two quarterly reviews to do with clients that meeting. So I actually only had an hour in the office. So it was in the next hour, what can I do to direct my company to fix this problem and get everyone on the same page as quickly as possible? And off the back of that, I then went to the next coaching session two days later and I still hadn't taken the bell jar off this. And one of my notes was, what happens in this situation, Gav, when the bell jar is still on? Because I think when it comes off, I'm still going to react emotionally mm. about it. It's an and interesting we, point. And then we spent half the session on going into something called unconditional positive regard, which is an understanding of people around you don't actually want to do bad work. Like 99% of people want to do good work. They want to keep you happy. They want to keep friends happy. They want to keep the boss happy. They want to do good. And it's that whole thing, where, like I think I mentioned on last show, but when someone cuts you up in a roundabout, it's normally, especially the wife, she dropped the C word and hopefully the kids have got the headphones on the back so she doesn't swear in front of the kids. She'd kill me if she even suggested that. But you just think, what an arsehole for cutting me up in a roundabout. You yeah. don't know whether that person's on the way to the hostel and his wife's in labor. Like You don't know. So it's a mindset when you view the world and as well as your team is they don't want to do good they don't want to do bad work so what's going on in their world that's making them Mm. do bad work and that's a new mindset for me so then I actually went for a conversation with this person and I had to take some responsibility because this person within our team has has been sucked into doing work that she hasn't been trained to do and I've because she's smart I've expected it from her Mm. and then if I have to take a step back and reflect it's well, of course she can't deliver on it and I can't get angry about it. There's certain things that we need to fix, but the walk and talk was all around. Here's what I think's happened. You've been asked to do this and it's on me. You deserve better training. However, these two things happen off the back of that that I was disappointed with that we need to fix. And we had a really open, honest conversation. And four hours later, I got a text message saying, super appreciate the talk that conversation would never have happened unless I had those two coaching sessions. And it's not about the coach telling me what to say. It's about giving me the tool set to better understand my mindset and how to manage a team. That's, so that's, that's two of the points. So the bell jar and the unconditional positive regard is when you're looking at stuff is try and look at it in generally a more positive lens than we naturally do because it's so easy to fall into a negative mindset and negative mindset over time just breeds negativity so it's actually taking a step back information is not good it's not bad it's just information what's happening right now and when you then start to analyze it don't put a slant on well that person is lazy or that person doesn't care just try and look at the facts and then switch your mind and say well they, i know they want to do good work otherwise i wouldn't have hired them there's an attitude there that i know can be good what are their motivations right now and have they been trained to do the work that i've been asking them to do and it's like making it more introspective for me as I'm trying to manage the team. So there's any any questions on that those two things before I go into the last one? Um, not directly, but I suppose we could we could dive into that a bit more um, 
but it's like long term if at what point good question at what point do you at what point is it where it's like okay so I've, I've tried seeing your side of things like where am I making the mistake as opposed to you making the mistake yep. where in that how long before it's like I'm doing everything I can but you just keep messing up yep sort of thing yeah great question and if you, let's just go to the extremes okay um, and this is this is hyper, this is not fact. This is me just saying it on the mics to make a point. Is let's just say that because of what happened, I wanted to fire this person. Mm-hmm. I could have fired them, okay, and it would have came from a place of frustration, from anger, from disappointment. However, having that conversation with them and saying, "Here's where we are. Here's what we need to improve." If three weeks, four weeks, six weeks passes and we maintain radical candor, honest conversations with each other and there's no improvement, at that point, and this really feeds nicely onto the next thing, if you've trained them through the activities that they need to be good at and you're still not seeing the improvement, you can have a really, really open and honest conversation and have no guilt and say, this isn't working, is it? Like there's no shock there's no surprise it's you take them on a journey with you and you can say listen we've done our best here the stuff that I need you to do just isn't getting done and we've tried yeah because you'll have had the conversation <clears throat> saying look we need to th- this will only work if we can both yep. pull this out of the bag exactly uh, which which leads me on to nicely point number three which is something called situational <laughs> leadership which is for every person within the company they go on this this journey uh, and the journey looks like a a path through through their role depending on what tasks that they do so it's if you imagine like a box actually everyone should just go and i'm not trying to explain this because it just makes no sense to people go and google situational leadership and there'll be a two by two box and in the bottom right hand corner you'll see the word directing so the mindset around this is is across the bottom it's directive behavior and across the left hand side um, y axis it's supportive behavior so everyone tends to fall into a leadership style so everywhere I've worked previously the boss has led the team in a specific way that works for them some people are very authoritative do this do this do this some people are I'll hire the best people in the world and just let them get on with their job and just completely get out of their way but what you tend to find is the leader finds a style that works for them and they roll that out to the rest of the team. The thing that I'm trying to learn about right now is something called situational leadership, which means actually, Harry, what you do on video, you are fantastic, okay? So you would move into the delegating stage, which is what's classed as like the holy grail, which is uh, S4. So it means I don't need to support you to do that. I can give you a task. And on the off chance you need my opinions, I'm here but you can get on with it. It's the polar opposite of S1, which is directive, which would be me saying, Harry, what I need you to do is shoot this video. Here's the outcomes of what I need. And here's the frames that I need. And I've done a storyboard for you. Are you mm, really clear on okay. everything that we need to do? And the, the, th- the, the key thing that I learned in the last session is it doesn't matter if I think you are an A player with video. Because most leaders then say, I can just delegate to Harry, I can trust him, get on with it. But the problem is, is if I introduce something new into the company and it's new for me and you, we both have to say, Harry, by the way, on this chart, you're an S4. With video, you're an S4. Like, you're great at this. I don't need to do anything with you on this. You, you're the master of your own destiny when it comes to that role. However, I've asked you to do this new thing and this is new for both of us. So when it comes to this, you're an S1, which means I'm gonna be directing everything that I need until I can move you through to the coaching stage and then the supporting stage and then finally the delegating stage, which is the goal. So it's a really interesting chart, actually. I'm just looking at it. It's a it's like a backwards scale. Yeah. Sorry, not a backwards scale, but you where you want to be is bottom left. Bottom left as yeah. opposed to top right. So yeah. <laughs> so I advise everyone to go look at that. The key things that I, t- I took away from it is I, I have my own natural leadership style but it needs to change dependent on where that employee is within their learning of that task, which is where most people get it wrong. They look at an employee and go, he's great, she's great. Whereas 
we might do something new. We're a young company, we're a startup, we keep mm. changing things. How, so what I need to do is say, actually, what are the key responsibilities for that person? And I've got, I've got a session to do that, as in like just document it. And then where do they fit on this chart for that activity? Because I need to spend more time with people that are an S1 and direct them compared to saying, you're really smart, Harry, can you fix this for me? And you're like, well, this is new. And then I get really frustrated with you because you haven't delivered, even mm. though I can delegate work to you. And that's where the mismatch of expectations come from boss and, uh, boss and colleague or however you want to phrase it. So that for me, super important. I'm going through that learning curve right now. My activity was to plot everyone on their own situational leadership graph with the key roles and responsibilities that they do. And that was one thing that came out of it that helped me with certain members of the team to go, actually, you haven't been trained in this area, but I'm asking you to do stuff as if you've been doing it for two years. So I need to sort of take a step back and better support the team. So they're my three points. So it's the bell jar, the unconditional positive regard, and the situational leadership are the three things that I really took away from the session one and a bit of session two. Uh, I'm looking forward to reporting back. I hope this is interesting to people, most importantly. The key thing for me, and especially if you're in our Facebook group, can you just do me a favor after reading this or listening to this, sorry, jump in and just tell us if you want to hear more of this stuff on the show because we can go into uh, the weeds of Facebook ads and how to do all this and we're going to get to the more tactical stuff and I'm looking forward to that. I actually got a conversation to have with Harry off the mic so I've got a three-part series I want to do for the Startup Diary cool. about Facebook ads based on the talk that I gave um, as like a bonus. Here's the thing that mm-hmm. is now happening. Enjoy. Um, but is is this coaching thing that i'm going through interesting to you on the mics uh if so let me know how do i make it more interesting if not be honest because there's so many things that we could talk about let us know guys and then before we move on uh just to wrap this up what do you you know what you're going into next week with with your coach this week yeah um great question so i had to go in last week so I'm on I've done two sessions right now mm-hmm. so just to put that out uh, and at the moment the frequency is weekly it might end up moving to bi-weekly don't know um, the key thing that came out is we, we did a, a gap analysis of what matters to me and how happy I am in that area of my life um, so what that looks like is that to list the, the key pillars for me so I'm, re- I'm really getting deep here uh, and sharing uh, but here we go so the my list uh, and this isn't in order okay this was just the stuff that, that came out uh, family kids impact business friendship health and well-being and wealth the pillars so seven pillars of me how I think about stuff does uh, it have to be seven no or did you no, no. get to seven? I got to seven okay. and he actually <clears throat> said really lucky you got seven because there's a there's a uh, there's an understanding there's work done that people can never focus on more than seven things if you if you add an eighth thing in everything suffers dramatically so if you were to do seven if you had seven projects on that is the the absolute capacity of any one person's mind before everything dramatically starts to fail obviously if you do one two things you'll have more focus you'll do them better but after the point of seven just in terms of cognitive function mm. you will you will do, if you imagine exponentially <laughs> the wrong way yeah. start to see a decrease in output um, and then he asked me to rank it all in terms of how happy I am on a scale of 1 to 10 uh, of where I am with that pillar of my life and I ranked them all and he just kind of off the cuff asked the score um, and sadly for me frustratingly is that the, the key area of my life the number one priority for me in my life is my kids however I scored a 5 out of 10 on that which was my lowest scoring and, I, and it kind of just came out uh, which he's really good at and just getting the truth out of you and he said well let's let's spend a week on that I want you to understand why that is and I guess I'll tease it for the next show but he's very quickly found out that I do something he phrased it in the in the session and he's never used the analogy before but um, I Wallace and Gromit things so uh, I'll explain what that is <laughs> a nice little teaser I'll explain what that is uh, on the next show but for me I've got a few exercises to do about my uh, a couple on the business, so two two things about the business and two things about the family and the kids, um, and I'll explain the insight that he gave me, and he was a hundred percent right. Um, yeah, Wallace and Gromiting. Yeah. I actually have uh, a note that says Wallace and Gromit analysis. I know what that means because it's a, a personal note, uh, but it sounds absolutely mental. But Wallace and Gromit analysis. Stay tuned on the next episode. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. We shall be right back with some listener questions after this short break. 
And we're back, guys, with listener questions. And we have two listener questions today, and one of them is from Jamie. And to be honest, guys, we only have two more in the bank after today. So if you do have any questions, Harry, what's the best email address to send them into? Great question, Adam. They can email startupdiary at nbs.fm. That's startupdiary at nbs.fm. I would just like to sort of apologize to people because I do realize we've changed emails a few times fairly in fairly rapid succession. But it's the crazy growth, man. And NBS is here to stay now. So the email for the final time is startupdiary at nbs.fm. So, what I'll do is I will jump in here because I believe just looking at these questions, it's more geared towards yourself. I assume um, so, because one of them's from you. But <laughs> that, that was what gave it away to me, to be honest <laughs> with you. Um, yeah, so we'll start with mine because I think it's very uh, appropriate. Yeah. Because two shows ago, he's asking himself as he frantically checks his notes. Uh, yeah, 319 becoming a talent scout for your business. We were talking about hiring because we yep. are in the process of hiring. And we had an interview yesterday as of time of recording. And I'd already spoke to the guy, mm-hmm. liked him, thought it was worth him coming in and you meeting him because ultimately you make the final say. And I think you and me, we as everyone does, everyone people see people in different ways. And I was looking at him from like a like a personality and a talent basis, whereas you needed to know whether he's fit for the business overall. Yep. Um, so my question, um, so long story short, he's not got the job. Correct. Um, Do you think he's aware of that? I think he's very aware of it. And that was kind of what my question was, is it was very short, sweet to the point. Mm-hmm. Um, so for people that obviously weren't in the room, basically he came in, you asked him kind of a similar conversation I'd already had with him. And then you kind of, you didn't cut him off, but he, he was telling his full story. He said, you were like, cool, I've heard enough. And then you explained to him that he's just not going to be a good fit for the company or the company's not going to be a good fit for him. Yep. If, it is probably a better way of, of explaining it. My question is, at what point, <laughs> what was the turning point when it was like, this isn't right for either of us. Mm-hmm. And so that that's like Q1. Then question two is what would he have had to have said or done or shown to have got the inverse reaction from you? Yep, okay. Um, so I guess for some context, he gave his backstory and we went into it and I wanted to hear from him um, why he's interested in video work. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, and then it wasn't, we didn't go straight into the cutoff and then me explain why it's not fit. I then wanted to zoom into a couple of questions that came out of a conversation that we had ahead of going into the room, which is super passionate. Yep. Super passionate guy. Um, clearly can apply himself to do work and has started something on the side mm-hmm. because he loves video work that much. Not sure about long term commitment you didn't use the word commitment but that's what that's what i heard which not sure about long-term commitment to the company need to understand what he wants to do with his career yeah so i then so it was he gave his talk about him i then zoomed in with a few questions and then as he was answering i sort of cut off and said i, I kind of know enough now so to answer your first question which was the turning point i'm really aware now of who i want to hire in the team uh, not just from a function perspective, but from a, I know what I want to build. As in, this is not just about expert trades for me. My goal, my ambition is to build a, a team of people. That's all a company is. A company is a team of people uh, that do amazing work, but most importantly, do ma- amazing work together. Because I'm fully aware that in two years time, five years time, or 10 years time, that expert trades might not be our core focus. It might not be our only focus. It might not be a focus at all. It might, mm. it might be something that was an amazing journey for us as a team. Like my objectives are very simple, is to build a team of people that I love to work with. And then I always find it interesting where you see companies get sold or acquired or something like that. And then majority of the people leave within like two years of the acquiring company. 
Whereas what I want to do is I want to build a team of people that we work together with for our careers. And that might be unrealistic, but that's my mission. That's what I want to do. So in the back of my head, I'm always thinking that I want to build something that even if we're not doing this thing called expert trades today, that the people in the room want to work together Mm -hmm. and we keep building businesses together. Okay. So that's in the back of my head. Second, as he spoke about, he mentioned the fact that he'd got a business on the side doing video production. I really admire that. He's an entrepreneurial guy. However, what it means is it's a distraction, okay? And I'm not saying you can't come work for me and have hobbies on the side, but the way that he spoke about it was that company is still gonna be running and it'll be an evenings and weekend work for him. And that doesn't jive well with me just because you know what it's like working here. Um, It can be consuming and it can need all your attention and your focus. And then the second part of it, in terms of the real turning point, is what he wants to do and achieve within a 10-year and a 20-year window of his career. There is zero chance that if he comes to work with me for five years, 10 years, whatever the number is, that he achieves his own personal goals. I think it's a responsibility of an employer to really understand what someone wants to do because I'm not in the mindset of hiring someone pumping as much energy and time and resource and support into them for two, three years to have them use that as an opportunity to go and do something else. If I hire an A player in and they leave after two years, it's on me because I didn't do enough to retain Mm. them. He was really clear in terms of he wants to learn and grow as a person. For me, the learn and grow needs to have a give and take. Like I need to have confidence that if I do my job well, I invest in that person and they do great work and they enjoy it that their long-term goals would be to stay with us as we grow and and build a really big business. That is not in his mindset. This was, I want to do this type of video work, whereas we do this type of video Mm. work, like two very different things. There's a big difference between a a BAFTA award-winning feature film compared to a 60-second social video for a hand tool made by a British, UK plumbing and Mm. manufacturer. Do you know what I mean? Like that is where we're at. So at the point I understood that, when I understood that this is a, this is a, I don't want to say stepping stone because it makes it sound negative because a lot of people should go and find jobs where they can excel, learn and grow and go past it. That's fine, but that's not what I'm looking for. Mm. And as soon as that twigged, that that was the turning point for me. Yeah, I think uh, you actually said something in the interview as well, which was, um, I think was kind of on point is you you were saying that if if you were if he was to work with us it would it would end up being I think I think you used the word soul destroying because uh, so suffocating yeah because like you say it's social shorts in comparison to feature length things and yeah like it it's, it was a shame because obviously he was super passionate and he was I think he was obviously struggling at the time to sort of get into the industry in general so this was an opportunity but like you say it's we're probably looking for someone that's long term going to be <laughs> with the team long term. <laughs> agree. Rather than uh, bouncing off. Yeah, um, I agree. What What would you have wanted to hear? Or, or, see, what, or, what, yeah. or what was it? <clears throat> that's a really hard question because. Yeah, yeah not the, necessarily what you wanted to hear, but what. what so I want to hear the truth. And that's mm, why I phrase yeah. the questions the way that I do. The reason that I specifically use the words and the terminology and the line of question that I use is because I want them to open up. And not, not just feel comfortable because I'm trying to like say, gotcha, that's not what I'm about. Mm. I want them to be really honest with who they are. Anyone listening, if you're going for a job interview, do that. Mm. Like just be you. Because then you know if you don't get the job, it wasn't the right fit for you. 100%. So in terms of what I wanted to hear, it's hard because I, I don't know what I want to hear. Uh, I just know the things that will turn me off yeah. more importantly. And it's not a reflection of him as a person. It's a reflection of the role that I'm trying to hire for because I think the thing that I've learned with hiring is as a team, the quality of the people that we hire is super important. The amount of time and money we try and spend and invest and like the hiring process and the onboarding process and the learning journey. As soon as someone's been in here for three to six months, there's a lot of time that's been spent yeah. on them to get them into the expert trades way. I don't want to hire someone that in the back of my head, I'm thinking flight risk. I think that's what it boils down to. And as soon as that flight risk switch went on, I'm like, not for me. If he came, as I said, like we've got other interview candidates that are like awesome, like really good in terms of their ability. My mindset and my line of questioning will be different for those people Mm. compared to, because I knew the amount of time we'd have to invest on training that person there. Look at Leon. Like Leon, we offered him the job in, this was the exact opposite interview. (laughs) Like to, 
Within seven yeah. minutes of speaking to Leon, I knew I wanted to offer him a job. Within seven minutes, I think it was less, of speaking to this chap, I knew it wasn't a fit. And the reason that I went to, rather than saying, let's spend an hour together, let's talk about it, da-da-da, why? For the first, I went into that interview in my head and said to myself, literally these words, as soon as I know it's not a fit, I've got to tell him. So I did. And it was a really hard thing to do in the moment, but after I came away from it, I thought that was 100% the right thing to do. Because what normally would have happened is you would have gone away, you'd got an email in two days time saying it's not for us, and some emails would have gone backwards and forwards. Or worse, I would have said to you, Harry, not a fit, here's why. And then you would have had to try and translate mm-hmm. that, sucking up your time. Whereas I could have had a hard one minute conversation and then put a stop to it, and then we can move on. That was the, that was the mindset of going into that interview. Yeah, I was, I was, even I was hurting a little from it, but it was, uh, it's, it's the right thing to do though, because yeah, you're wasting everyone's time, aren't you? It's like, um, <laughs> it's like when you're in a bad relationship with, with a woman or, or a guy, or depend if you are a woman or whatever, um, is that when you know it needs to end, but you're still together, it's, it's like around, you, yeah. you're not helping each other out. You need to just set each other free. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing that made me feel like even better about it is the comment, because I, I, I ejected myself and left you in the room. I know. Uh, <laughs> oh my God. But that's because you'd had a first round interview and most importantly, I, I didn't know whether you guys wanted to cover something off. A, qu- a question on that. Was yep. I supposed to, did, was there anything I should have done? Like, or No, no. The reason that you're in the room was exactly the reason that when you came up and you're like, because he would have like dropped his guard with you mm. and the fact that he came up and was like oh, fuck it, I was really counting the show I just need some cash my side business is unreliable cool we made the right decision mm. it just compounded that so the things that I picked up on he reinforced with the conversation he had with you afterwards cool so that's fine cool man <laughs> <laughs> thank you Harry for asking that question um, uh, next question is from Jamie he asks What's your process when creating a presentation? As I, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't probably know not asking the, the right person here, Jamie, but we'll we'll, we'll go on. Um, I always seem to get writer's block. Any tips on? Oh, and any tips on delivering a good presentation that makes a lasting impression? Oh, you're asking the wrong person, Jamie. Um, largely because my presentation process is not <laughs> consistent. Uh, to use that I mean there is a consistency to it in the time frame in which they're made normally (laughs) if you've got a train journey down it's being made on the train so let me just tap into that because I guess (laughs) I guess that will help but because that's correct and that that's I would say that is unprofessional of me but I've never let it affect my output and performance on the day uh, I think it, I think that really sorry to interrupt, but I think that really plays into your style and who you are. Like you're very like just go find me out of a cannon. I'll just present like I'll just I'll dive into a room. I'll sell you whatever you're wearing. Like just whatever it is, yeah, you, I'll sell the shirt off your back. Sort of mentality. That's how you work. So with a presentation, it's like show me the slides and I'll present it. <laughs> but that, okay, so let's zoom into that because that, that's where it gets interesting. Is when I feel over scripted, I really I know now because I've done lots of presentations. Mm. I know that when I over prepare for a presentation, if, and someone's going to say you can't over, I can mentally. When I overwork a presentation, I end up working one to a script and two to the, just to the slides. Whereas where I am in my best is I have the topic that I want to cover. So one, if uh, what's his name, Jamie. So if Jamie's writing a presentation, firstly, he just needs to know his shit. Okay, because that puts you in a new mindset of just being extremely comfortable in a room mm-hmm. of 10 people to 500 people. We gave the presentation last year, there's 600 people in the room. But because I knew my stuff of what I was talking about, I felt so comfortable on that stage, right? So comfortable. So one, don't give any talks or presentations on subject matter you don't know. Secondly is don't write a presentation to make you feel smart, which is what I think most people make the mistake of. Don't try and build a presentation out to put a spotlight on how good you are at what you do, okay? A a presentation, let's just say it's how to do this on Facebook or seven things you need to know about marketing for a trades professional. You're writing that presentation for the people in the room, not for yourself. So the biggest mistake that I see people make is try and overcomplicate things because they're like, I'm in front of everyone, I need to look smart. Whereas the, the presentations that last and make an impact are the ones that resonate with the audience and you're actually answering their questions. 
So a presentation tip that I used to do, but I know my audience that well now I don't need to. Actually, I say this, but I even did this recently for the for the one I did last week, is ask them what are their top questions ahead of time. So we know our audience. We mm-hmm. went and did a presentation to trades people and it was about marketing. Like what are the things you want to learn about marketing? So then all I did was take the voice of the customer and then use my apply my knowledge and drop it onto a presentation and it, it worked really, really well. So answer it for the people in the room. And then I would say from a styling perspective is just a little bit of a top tip is do not read the slides okay the slides are there purely to support the words that you say uh too many people literally the presentation that i went to last week they would click a slide and they would look up and they would check the right slides on the screen and then they would read it verbatim okay that's not a presentation okay? and there's uh, if they're reading it it means there's obviously a lot of text on there as well it's there it's like you say it's their it's their full presentation on the screen yep so do you know what, Jamie? I just want to put you in contact with a chap called Stephen May in our audience for this one because, like, there's so many things that he he's already taught me about presentations, and we've only just skimmed the surface. But I would say my top tips, because this is a short listener question segment, is know your shit, answer, help the audience, not yourself. Don't try and make yourself look smart, and use slides to support and illustrate what you say, not as a prompt for what to say if that makes sense there, there would be there'll be my top tips cool uh guys if you have a question just like jamie or me you can email <laughs> startup diary at nbs.fm and we will read them on the show for now let's take a quick break and we'll be back with last week this week and we're back with last week this week adam what'd you get up to last week um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure I didn't say last week correctly, but you also, I didn't realize you were coming back into the show. I was just reading a message from actually Stephen May. Um, Busy, mate. Talk, talk of the devil. Not like we're on a show that people tune into weekly. Sorry. Not, I didn't not a top you're... 10 business podcast that people want to expand their knowledge, you know, just. Sorry. Whenever you're ready, mate. No rush. Last week. <laughs> I'm going to whistle through these because we, we tend to dwell more on what's happening this week. So last week, uh, BDM started. Alan, business development manager, started with us. Um, it's been nice knowing him. Been nice knowing him. He, honestly, I don't think he listens to the show, uh, to be honest, apart from the episode that he was on. Uh, he's impressed me so far. Um, do, you, do you know what? I've liked the energy that he's brought to the room. And yeah. he, obviously, he's a nice guy anyway, but I mean, when I see him speaking to you, yeah. I can see like a... And another level happening because no, it's like it's like now Leon's here. Like we even just talking about the software we're using, there's a little bit of a more creative energy that's flowing. Yeah. And like when he when Alan's speaking to you, there's like it's like business sales, pow pow, like it, <laughs> because you've got someone else that's yeah talking to you about that field that you're all about. Yeah. Because there's been no one else in the team really that's been good at sales. <laughs> no, a hundred percent. And that I think. I'm interested to see the, the the dynamic and the chemistry build on that creative team, especially mm. as you bring a new videographer in. I think that's going to be really interesting to watch. Um, yeah, with Alan's uh, one, I, I've enjoyed that as well. It's just little things like going to a conference last week and seeing a new brand and taking a photo of the brand. So this is a true story. I took a photo of the brand and sent it to him. At three days later, I have an invitation in my inbox for a call with that brand about mm. what we do. You have to understand that what normally would happen was seen the brand, made a note, got busy, forgot, mm-hmm. then gone on to the next conference and gone, oh, that's that brand I was meant to reach out to. Like there's so many- Search your notes, realize you already had it. Exactly. So then, so there's all these missed opportunities, but having someone that I can rely on to do that mm-hmm. with very little context, because I don't have time to do like, oh, there's this brand and they do this. And uh, like I sent it across to Alan, I'm like research them and see where, where you can get to. You end up getting on the phone with the MD within 24 hours and we've got a call with them next week. Like that's been really interesting for yeah. me. Uh, I think for him to obviously basically hit the ground running as opposed to like you're not bringing someone in to learn the role, to yep. understand what you need from them. Does this relate back to the situational leadership thing? Don't know, but... Uh, not Well, to be honest, it does a little bit just because if I sort of think of it a bit more macro, we hired him for 10 days as a consultant, which allowed me to understand where he is on that chart 
it does completely if I think about it through is we sell different products. So I'm really confident that certain products that we sell because they're fairly black and white, I can delegate them out to him. Mm -hmm. Whereas if we're looking at like a partnership, he's still in the S1 stage. I direct him on what to do and what to say. Yep. And what I like about him is his self-awareness because he's come in and when you come into a new role, you always want to impress, but he's come in and literally asked me the terminology of an email. Like, should I say it like this or should I say it like that? And I, I like the fact that he's going aggressively to the market, knowing that if he has any doubt or questions, he's going to come to me and ask. And he's not too, mm. oh, I can't ask the boss that, I should know this. It's, no, no, like, what's your opinions on this? Really enjoyed that so far. Um, so there was that. There was the insight group last week. I'm not going to dwell too much on this, um, but I think from the insight group that we did, we were just a little bit, um, we got like an inside baseball to a company and we got to see some internal yeah. politics taking mm. place. There might be a show there in terms of, not about them, because I'm not here to hang their dirty washing out. It's how you as an agency manage a relationship with a brand that has their own internal issues. And when when is the right time to say bye to the brand, which we've done recently for the exact same reason we have chosen to say bye because of their internal politics. And the other side of it, which is when you have to act like the bridge between the two parties to get mm. them onto common ground, otherwise your life is going to be hell working with that brand. So that I think could be interesting in a future show once yeah. we've done a little bit more. Uh, so that's taking place. Uh, went down to FEX, which is uh, was at Tottenham Football Stadium uh, to give a talk uh, for the plumbing and heating expo kind of just covered a little bit of that off in terms of presentations uh, for that being really really honest like I, I nearly and I, I wanted to bail on that talk and to, like just because of how busy we are and the only reason I didn't bail is it's not in my nature to let people down like I just need a little nudge from a couple of the people that I know it's like don't be an idiot mm. uh, and what it kind of boiled down to is uh, the reason I end up going is I've committed to it so regardless of whether you want to do it or not I fucking committed to it. Like, I can't leave this guy in the yep. lurch. Uh, the learnings off the back of it was if I had to go and do that every other month, I would because wow. met the community. We had the busiest talk because our members knew we were there and we didn't like know that they were going. So when we when it was published that I was talking, we get to that stage now where people want to come and connect with the brand. Not me, but the brand. Mm -hmm. And having those five, six meaningful conversations with people in the audience after the fact for an hour, that lights me up. That's what I enjoy. So I have to remember that there's there's commitments, stick to them always, because I might I might want a favor from that guy over at FX in the future. And if I'm the guy who's been consistent, delivered, brought audience, I've got one in the bank with him. Secondly is there's always a byproduct to this stuff that you weren't thinking about. Like you don't know the opportunity cost yeah. until you go and actually do the it. The intangibles. Yeah. Um, and then what about you, mate? Uh, and then for me, nothing pff, really, just, you know, too little long. Uh, but the main thing for the listeners is uh, pretty exciting is our launch of Startup Stories is probably the most... Uh, the biggest thing in my mind right now um, so that's an interview style show with yourself I'm I'm purely in the background just doing the editing and things like that but I think we we had mixed emotion on what people thought about guests on the show um, as in this show yeah as in yep. Startup Diaries so we, we've we've had um, and we still have people like Tim Buick uh, from Street Pin I think those stories still make sense on Startup Diaries but when we had um, Ryan Sohan, yeah, we had bigger names, pe people that have made it, or yep. or or in big big companies that don't, it just didn't seem to fit startup diaries and and the startup nature and the kind of the early steps. How do I do this? Mm -hmm. um, didn't seem to make sense. So we've moved that into a new show. We've got people like Harry Hugo from the Go Agency, which is in itself their company is mad. I haven't uh, told you the follow up to that, have I? No. When so, are we back down there? So um, <laughs> probably next month. I'm not joking. Oh my god. Yeah. No. Um, so uh, originally we went down to speak to Aaron, who's one of the co-founders, yep. and we ended up speaking to Harry. Great interview. Uh, and off the back of that, uh, Aaron is going to be on the show. Amazing. Uh, so I had a three -way. I need a bag with wheels yeah, know, because yeah, lugging yeah. all that gear <laughs> is heavy. Uh, which would be good because those two. And I'd, what I'd like to do is I think Harry Hugo was the first episode of season one. Is that right? Apart from me, which is where Jeremy uh, quizzes me. I want to. Was it Andrew Allen? 
Either way, we should we should get. He's Aaron. in the first three because we dropped the first three in one go. We should get Aaron onto season two in, in the first few episodes, mm-hmm. which will be nice. Uh, and then if that goes well, we should get Nick their third party. So there's three co-founders there, just because each of those three have a very very specific role in that company and will mm-hmm. have their own thoughts and dynamic of what they want to bring to the show. Um, yeah, that's cool. And then you're you're dropping it on this show. We're dropping season one only on this show, aren't we? On a Saturday. Yeah, so the first one should have dropped the Saturday just gone, actually. Yep. I actually need to check my feed on that. No, I think it did. I think it did. I amazing, think amazing. I'm doing good. my job properly sometimes. Um, so that's that, guys. <laughs> if, if you haven't gone and subscribed to that yet, go and do it. Um, and for me, actually, if you listen to this now, because this is going to be in the first eight-week period for a couple of shows ahead, um, please go and hit the subscribe button and leave us a review or rating after you've listened to a couple of shows. That just helps other people find the show. Um, and for me, my goal is super simple. It's a selfish show. The bigger the show gets, the more inbound requests we will have from interesting people wanting to be on the show. Um, so that's my goal, is build a really big show so we can keep getting really, really interesting people on the mics. Um, and then moving on to this week, H... Um, Tomorrow, point of recording this, we're meeting up with uh, Dan and Sam from the All That Good Stuff podcast, members of the community. Um, I think we're getting, I think we're getting interviewed for their show, which I'm looking forward Are to. We? Yeah, which would be good. Exciting. Other side of the mics, um, and then for me, wonder if they're bringing their gear. Definitely not. One hundred percent. They're like, guys, guys, we didn't want to like bring all this up. You've got your I'll, own. I'll mics. be honest. When we went to the go agency, I thought they'll have all the gear. They've got they they vlog. They did a podcast, and I think they've restarted it now. So I'm thinking we can travel light. And it was like Harry, bring the gear, bring it all, oh, bring it no. all. No, it's good that we take our own stuff as well. We just need, we just need to not use a. Uh, a, a tool, tool case <laughs> <laughs> or at least a tool bag with wheels definitely um, so there's that and then for me uh, just wishing you a happy birthday this week mate you are you're the big 30 on Friday at the point of recording this so everyone listen to this you like 30 in 4 weeks or whatever it is uh, uh yeah, yeah, you're right. Sorry, I, I realised what you just said there. Yeah, so we're a few ahead. So as of time of recording, it is June the 18th. 18th. <laughs> yeah, so I'll be 30 on the 21st of June. So everyone can wish me belated happy birthdays. And I've got a note that you're going to Chicago, which you've corrected me on. So what are you doing uh, this week? So I am going to <laughs> Chicago again, actually, for with, with, with a client. Um, but we, Shout out to Jamie. We are moving up north to uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So that's exciting. Looking forward to that. But that's cool. You still, it's still pretty cool. It's still America. It's still, it's still America. America. It's uh, and what I remember you coming back with last time is obviously you can you you know that America food portions big, but you actually said it is like that, isn't it? It's like it's obscene, <laughs> obscene. I think I genuinely think I put. I mean, through my own fault, admittedly, because um, I'm the one putting it in my mouth. But like, if you want to, you can put a stone on in a few days here's a question you're on a really strict diet to the point that we had a team meal the other day and you had no dinner um yeah sorry that was a whole other thing by the way that wasn't just that wasn't necessarily the restaurant's issue but like um i think we i think you've you've been there before but it takes me so long to decide on what i want on the menu that when someone goes sorry we're out of that fine fine it's like it throws me yeah. completely for six and like I have to like go through this whole thing like that's like a bell jar thing for me but I need like another 15 minutes okay. and the problem is when they stood there with like the notepad and just waiting for you to make another decision like I had backups <laughs> like that so it was that was my bigger issue yeah okay rather than the fact that I couldn't have some things because if I had time you would have found I'd something. have chatted with her and said cool what this is what I can have what can you do but as it was she just kept saying no and in the end it was like you know what it's easier for me to just say nothing than than go through this anymore because it, all it was going to do was I work saw, me up I even saw the more. frustration yeah so that's yeah um, but my question on that is when you go to Chicago are you sticking to your not really okay cool I mean I probably could but what's the point I could but it it, it tends to because it's diff- to be fair it's probably easier because in America the customer service is amazing like it's, it's like customer service is a career over there whereas over here it's something they is have that to do because of the tipping mentality I think so. It promotes, okay. like, if you're good at your job, you actually earn more yeah, okay. through tips. Whereas over here, people don't want to serve you in any food anyway, but they're in the service industry. Yeah, it's, it's a whole the, thing. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. So, like, and apparently ordering what's on the menu is not the norm in America. Like, because you can say, oh, I'll have this, but hold that and add an extra whatever. Uh, okay. Like, that, that's the, th- like, and, and they'll do it. And they, they don't even have a, 
notepad to make a note of anything they're just like mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and yep. you're like this is ne-. in, in the UK you're like we're, we're gonna end up I asked for a steak and we come out with a fucking cheeseburger they, they write it down and still get it wrong in the UK <laughs> so who knows what goes on there but. cool well I'm looking forward to a trip report on that and then moving on to what we're into which isn't always about work it could be absolutely anything um, for me to keep it short and sweet uh, is going through this performance coaching that creates a lot of work for me, genuinely, like actions to do as if I have a boss, uh, which is, and he actually said, it's like, you're gonna get work to do. You need to do it. If you don't do it, don't come back. Uh, because it, there's a whole account. <laughs> but I'm still taking you to the boss. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a whole accountability thing here. It's like, uh, because what will happen is you'll do three or four sessions and then you naturally won't come back because you're not doing the work and you'll be like, oh, you'll cancel because you haven't done the work. You'll make up some bullshit excuse and then that will that will go from every week to every two weeks to once a month, once every three months and you won't get any results and both of us will be pretty pissed off with the whole situation. So do the work or don't come back. Serious. S- super and it doesn't mean do the work perfectly, like show progress is the key thing is. Take it seriously. So my what we're into right now is I am spending a lot of my time on really taking time to understand what we went through in the coaching session and then doing my follow-up actions and then applying myself to the learning process. It's it's not just the hour a week. It probably is, it's probably going to take up six hours a week for me in total. And is that, is that a six-hour sitting or is that no, 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 six like broken days up. an hour? Yeah, broken up. Uh, so I do an hour coaching session and then I, I put an hour in afterwards to pull my thoughts together on my mm-hmm. notes and outline my actions. So that's two hours gone. And then in the next seven days, I'll put like half an hour and an hour sittings in just to do some work. One of the things I've got to do this week is probably a two-hour thing, but... I'm building that time in to make sure that I take this seriously. And not to dive into it too much, but that's, I think that's a good um, approach for anyone to take with their business and things like that. Because you end up doing, you end up getting so involved in the day to day. Like we're going to have a conversation off the mics about sort of the shows and things like that. Because for the same reason, we've got into a routine of doing a lot, mm-hmm. but the direction is a bit kind of all over the place at the moment because we've not spent a bit of time to refocus, to see where we're at, what's working, what's not. So I think the um, taking a bit of time to review what's going on. Just on that, because I'm looking forward to, so the way that we're structuring those chats is, so MBS is sort of like your baby, to be honest. Mm. And that's down to one, where we want to take it to in the future and two, down to my time. Um, I think, and you, I'm not saying you have more time, especially with the kid on the way, but uh, this is naturally going to provide more opportunity if you really drive it compared to us both doing it when we can does that make sense no <laughs> so what, what, I'm not sure what you mean yeah I, I kind of came back full circle is unless one of us takes the lead on MBS mm. nothing we, we, yeah we're both we're both doing we'll both the show do as 20%. opposed to working yeah. on the show yeah, yeah we'll yeah. both do it at 20% yeah. because of the amount of time we have whereas what we kind of decided was Harry you take the lead on MBS and then an hour or so a week every other week whatever it ends up being we'll sit down and talk about the strategy for it yep. and that's where I'll try and help as best as I can but you're the one in the driving mm-hmm. seat yeah. I think that's, we'll- that's where this has fall, fallen down in air quotes at the moment that's because we've we're still working on it as opposed working that- in it as opposed to on it right now my question is, is um, whether we release it or not I think we should mic do you think we should mic up for that conversation about the one hour strategy session about MBS <sighs> Mm, I'm not sure as if it I'm not sure if it would be interesting or relevant because we might get in the weeds of like certain bits I don't know yeah okay we'll have a think okay mm. I think worst case we could probably mic up one session and then reflect on it and work out I think, I think may, will, maybe this first one no yeah. but maybe in others because ideally we're going to get a bit more direction. focus because yeah, okay. maybe in an two meters time it'll be like we need to discuss Facebook ads yep yeah okay makes sense or a channel that we're trying to grow so the first few sessions sort of is working out how the session is going to roll yeah. out and then I just think it'll be interesting for a fly on the wall for mm-hmm. people um, so that's my what I'm into Harry what are you into um, well everyone knows I'm having a baby I'm bearing it right now in my <laughs> hips um, <laughs> no the wife uh, but we had a gender reveal Everyone can catch up on this on Dad Knows Best. Just search it on on your uh, podcast player of choice. But we are having a boy, which so, is so happy, which is new news, which is exciting. 
So you're going to go. Now I've got to think of a name. Yep. Had three girls' names in the bank. Was buzzing about that. <laughs> Turns out we're having a boy. So back to the drawing. He's board. already causing your problems. No. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Typical tip of the iceberg. Um, cool. So you're just you're just in baby mode right when, now. When do I get the Louis Vuittons for the baby? <laughs> <laughs> speak, to, speak, speak to Zara that's one of the, the biggest upsides uh, that Harry's got is all the boy stuff that we've mm, got is naturally going to go over Ralph Ren, Louis we've got <laughs> Gucci he's talking shit but to be honest I disagree some, have, of, some of that was factually Ralph Ren is fact <laughs> because we at Mr Village there's a Ralph Lauren hey you don't shop. need to justify it you don't need to justify it. There's a Ralph Lauren. I do I really <laughs> really do there's a Ralph Lauren outlet shop at Bista and what what turned out is that the two, this was probably two and a half years ago, the two boys and me could all get kid. I could get like a 14, 15 year old kid's tea. This is when I was like skinny mini. Um, and you're thinking, when were you ever a skinny mini? But I could uh, get into a kid's raffle around. So we managed to kick the three of us out for like 24 quid. And that was the cutest thing in the world in Sarah's eyes. So it was worth it. So yeah, there is to a To be fair, mate, we're, you know what? We'll, we'll save this for dad knows best, but... <laughs> I saw the mini me range or something like that at next. It was so like- if you're enjoying this conversation about the kids, guys, go and tune in to Dad Knows Best, which is when two best friends talk about fatherhood. Uh, but on this note, for the startup diary, thank you so much for getting this far into the show. If you have not yet hit that subscribe button, make sure you do. We drop one episode a week that sounds like this. And then for season one of Startup Stories, you can grab it on a Saturday. But we do recommend you heading over there too if you enjoy the interview style with interesting entrepreneurs and founders. Email any questions that you've got to startupdiary at mbs.fm. And we'll see you next time.